<laughs> Let me start by saying that um, I, I will speak about a special case of, of uh, media change in the humanities, that of digital critical editions, from my own perspective as a Latin philologist. And I will, previous knowledge of the field, none whatsoever for granted. Um, many of you will already know a lot about this, so please be patient. Um, right, so media change today is uh, summed up by this image. Um, books, in this case, a uh, nice printed critical edition of the NAID, uh, are replaced by websites. Um, this is a digital edition of the same text. Uh, it happens that I am a, a scholar working on uh, textual transmission of Latin literature, and I have been doing research on a different kind of media change that took place in the 15th century, of course, that from manuscript to print. And here you see a 15th century manuscript of Catullus on the left, and on the right, um, the first page of the Editio Princeps, the first edition of Catullus. And as you will know, the media change from manuscript to print was quite a rough affair. And in this case, you can see how this early printed edition tries to imitate a manuscript, so spaces are left open for illuminated initials that have not been filled in, and titles are added kind of in a way in which manuscript titles would have been added, but of course um, it's quite hard to print in different colors while manuscript scribes just change their ink, so, so, so the titles cannot be made out very well on, in this printed edition, and it also has some different shortcomings um, print, early printed editions didn't have the same mechanisms of quality control as, ma as manuscripts did. So that media change wasn't very well managed. And my, um, perhaps we could manage uh, the media change that is undergoing, um, that, that, that is going on today a little bit better than this. Um, why does media change matter at all? Well, you know, Marshall McLuhan's um, dictum, the medium, is the message. Um, its mediums are extremely, media are extremely important. Um, but my attitude would rather be trying to shape the new medium, trying to, to, to find ways to use it, it as, as well as we can. So, I will start by drawing up a typology of digital publications in the humanities, especially in, 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 in classics. And I drew up a rough in databases and scholarly studies. Scholarly studies are, I mean by scholarly studies, articles and monographs. Um, argumentative analytical text um, drawn, written by um, one or more academics. Um, some digital databases on classical Greece and Rome are, and here I introduce a sub-typology, um, they include catalogues of rea realia, of objects, for instance, uh, an excellent database of classical Greek vases. Um, a subcategory of this, 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 this class is our book catalogues, where books are uh, treated as pieces of evidence or objects to study. So there is a, a, a corpus of classical Latin incunabula in concept in Spain, then another, another uh, an international short titled catalog of incunabula run by the British Library, and then several excellent online catalogs of, of, of medieval manuscripts, and so on. We also have um, maps on digital maps of classical Greece and Rome, um, quite a list there. Um, we have lexicons, um, both of, of uh, languages, such as the Thesaurus Linguae Latinae Online. Sadly, it's a very, very expensive uh, uh, online publication, but very good. And we have uh, smaller, more limited corpora, such as the lexicon of Greek personal names online. We have coll collections of online texts, Epidoc Hesperia, um, Musisque, Deuque, Persos Digital Library, and so on. Um, and then there is once again a subcategory of databases on individual texts. Catalus Online, the Homer multi-text, which we have just seen, 
and so on. Um, we also have databases on individual topics such as sites, finds, collections, the Vindolanda tablets online, Project World Era, the Giza archives, and so on. And this is just a selection. So there is a huge amount of online databases available uh, scholar. Now, digital scholarly studies such as monographs and articles. Journals, digital journals, they're not very many. The one I was thinking of especially was Digressus, but it was closed down, it shut down a couple of years ago. There is a special subcategory that of review journals, bring more, bring more classical review, the classical journals, online reviews, and perhaps a couple more, but not that many. Um, digital monographs, I don't really know. I, I, sorry, I don't really know. Um, I, I would be hard pressed to find, um, to think of. Uh, major discoveries in, in classical philology that were not first published properly in print but in a digital medium. There are also the digital shadows of printed publications such as e-books um, that appear together with the printed books, but you know, an e-book tends to be a reproduction um, of a dig digital reproduction of a printed book. Um, the digital versions of articles that appear on JSTOR and the uh, often clandestine versions of digital books on Libyan. We have a huge amount of digital databases, the amount of scholarly studies. Why is this? Why? What explains this distinction? Um, well, digital databases can do more than paper-based databases. There is a huge advantage um, in favor of of the digital medium in where databases are concerned. You can include more data. You can put better internal connections. Um, you can provide more search options. Um, most scholarly studies do not need these possibilities, or they only need them tangentially. It's useful if you can link in your footnote, if you can link your footnote directly to the article you are referencing, but it's not indispensable. Um, Digital publications also tend to yield less prestige. Your reaction might be, why should I care? Well, that was my reaction 10 years ago, but then I had to deal with applications, job applications, search committees, and the like. And um, sadly, uh, they do not look kindly on digital publications. So um, as you will see, one of the most important uh, publications that I, I have to my name at the moment is a digital, um, digital, and um, in the Spanish national uh, habilitation process that I am applying for, it will probably count for one point out of hundred. So, uh, a, a very, very, very minor achievement by those standards. That's that's a minor inconvenience. So it doesn't pay off you know, often for for academics to to prepare digital publications. Um, I think that that's a that's a big pity and that should be uh, changed uh, as, as, as much as possible. Traditional publishing houses and journals also often offer excellent support to authors. Um, they, they let you improve your text, they, they help you with typography, with bringing, you, bringing your writing to, to potential readers, and so on. And there are a few digital equivalents to these. Um, so, in other words, the inertia principle works against the digital media in scholarly. Um, it's, it's, it was always done. Uh, articles and monographs were always prepared, published on paper, so they continue to be published in that way. Um, and, well, my naughty final hint is, well, that perhaps databases are methodologically easier to prepare than scholarly studies. Um, you, you collect data possibly for a very, very long time, and, and that's it. And it's, they, 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 they are less risky. And if, if you do something very risky, you might want to do it the traditional way. So are digital editions of text databases for scholarly studies? The obvious answer would be that they are databases, because 
Well, first of all, because of their basic concept, they reproduce a great amount of data. Um, and this data is in a searchable, it comes in a searchable and often in an interconnected format. And it's also often enormous, it can run to hundreds of thousands of words or even more. Um, but there is also a case to be made for seeing digital editions of texts as scholarly studies, at least some editions, because of, first of all, their concept. Um, as you will know, when we edit a classical Latin or Greek text, in most cases, we don't simply uh, type, uh, type out an inscription or a manuscript, but we reconstruct the original text. Um, and also the production process. Uh, so in other words, the production process um, qualifies digital editions as scholarly studies, because what is at stake is not mechanical data gathering, but critical thought. So, so this we might be on on the border between these two categories. So, classical Latin and Greek texts have appeared in print um, today, and they have appeared for the last couple of decades in a large and very varied and colorful ecosystem that consists of school texts, bilingual editions, scholarly editions, and a, a lot as artistic editions, um, whatever. And at the apex of, its, of this ecosystem, there stand critical editions. So what makes an edition critical? Most of you will probably already know, but um, well, there are some criteria. Um, it must present uh, critically, so systematically and rationally um, reconstructed text. Um, it has to have a critical apparatus showing how this re reconstructed text relates to the sources and to alternative reconstructions. And there should be some kind of a list, a survey, or a count of, of the sources um, and how you refer to them. Um, it's also quite important, um, I haven't added this here, but it's quite important to have a, a reference system of paragraphs or line numbers or whatever, so that uh, you can you can key your, your critical apparatus to the text. Printed critical ed editions of classical Latin and Greek texts, they are uh, products of centuries of evolution. They have a sophisticated typography and light layout. They are often um, um, masterpieces of printing. And are, they, they often appear in established series, the Biblioteca Toignariana, the Oxford Classical Texts, and so on. And they are often products of by expert scholars, years or decades of preparation. And their virtues are the quality of the reconstruction of the text, the reliability of the contents, and the transparency of the presentation. And they serve to present the text and to clarify its survival and the modality um, how, of its reconstruction. Here is an example. This is, um, uh, well, I, it's close to home. This is the Virgil's, the, the first page of the critical edition of Virgil's N.A edited by my doctor supervisor, Gian Biagio Conte, in the Biblioteca Fred Mariana um, eight years ago. Uh, you see uh, the first 11 lines of the N.A, followed by um, a very brief reference to the sources that are quoted here. These, these letters uh, list the manuscripts that, that are relevant for, for this section of the text. And then what is here, quite a rich critical apparatus. Um, so, 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 so you see that this is—it's quite a challenge to produce such such a piece of text. I tried to to produce this with MS Word, and it was pretty hard. Um, how do, on the other hand, classical Latin and Greek texts appear in the digital space? Um, well, here I must quote Homer, um, who writes in another context um, about uh, the Greek soldiers under. There were so many that I could not name every single one of them, even though I had ten, ten tons, and though my voice failed not and my heart were of bronze within me. So if I went on talking un until midnight, I could probably not list every single classical, Latin, classical Greek text available online. There is a huge wealth of them. Um, some main types are, well, to start with the most basic uh, and the most conservative form, scans of printed editions. And here you see uh, 
uh, um, the first page of Lachmann's classic 1829 edition, um, available online through the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek. Um, uh, in the legal zone of, of printed, of, of scanned printed editions, there is also a gray or illegal zone uh, provided by Lipgen and others. Um, it's not a place I like to go to, so I don't know it very well. Um, often these lack OCR, so the, these scans of printed edition, editions are not searchable, um, which would be one of the main advantages of the digital medium, and they're often dated at least when they come in the legal zone. The next type of digital text, um, of, of, of Latin texts online and Greek texts online, um, is of digital texts. Here you see a, quite a basic example, the Latin library. It's one of the oldest ones. You, you see it, it has a very um, basic minimalistic but also functional uh, um, introductory page. And incidentally, you see how that I've used this quite a lot. It's a, it's a useful resource for all its shortcomings and its limitations. Here you see the start of, of uh, Virgil's and Eight Book One. Um, as it comes in the Latin library, um, with vowel lengths indicated and with lines numbered. The, the lines of the poetry and the paragraphs of the prose texts are not always numbered in the Latin library. The presentation is inconsistent, so sometimes um, sometimes uh, the letter V is used as it's here, it's used here, and sometimes it, it sometimes um, some texts have a, a consonantal U, so they would write U, I, or we, um, there are problems there. Um, a more sophisticated body of digital text is, um, of course, the Perseus Digital Library, and here you see the start of NA1 in, um, in, uh, in its, the, the Latin text of, of Virgil's NA1 in First use. Um, it's accompanied by notes, the notes of Tillo, the notes of Connington, an English translation, another English translation, and all sorts of other references, vocabulary tools, and the like. So this is a rich and helpful tool. You can also see some of its limitations. Um, the text is based on an edition by Greenall that appeared in 19, 1900, more than a century ago. And um, sorry, it's so it's it's an old text. The commentaries are also old. This is um, it's not the most recent material that you could get. You also see that this is not a critical edition. Well, so bodies of di digital texts um, include ones that I've already named, and also uh, the Packard Human Institute's Classical Latin Text, which is a very 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 good resource for for lexical searches, um, thesaurus and Weibracher, and that's it. Um, their advantages are that it's great to have large digital libraries at hand, especially if you are not near a good research library, a paper-based research library. Um, they have open access, um, and at least the Perseus Digital Library offers a wealth of interconnected material, including digital translations. Um, you can search. Um, which is also a huge benefit. But the drawbacks are that the texts are often dated, they're not critical editions, and at least in the li Latin library, there are problems with formatting, as we have seen, and there are also big problems with accuracy. You cannot quote these ed editions. Um, if you quote a Latin or a Greek text in, in a scientific publication, then you have to be accurate, and, and, and that is today to use a paper-based edition. Sadly. There does exist one body of digital critical editions. Most of them are critical, which is why I use brackets here. Not all, but most of the texts on this page are. Um, that's the Italian website Musis Quedeoque, which aims to embrace all Latin poetry ever written. It doesn't, but it goes a long way. Um, here you see an A1 um, in, in Musis Quedeoque. Um, and when I did this screenshot, I had clicked on La Vignacque, on a problematic passage here, and and to see the apparatus, which is quite rich. And um, to this, to this 
word. And um, on the right below, you see also the, a list of the sources for the text. And um, they, for the NA, they simply took over um, uh, Mario J. Monat's 2008 critical edition. So this is not dated, it's a different edition from Compress, mm -hmm. it's, uh, which, which I had shown um, before. It's perhaps a little bit less good, but it's still a very, very good and a very usable text. But this is still a shadow of a paper-based critical edition. There are digital critical editions that are not the shadows of paper-based work. Um, one, the first one to appear, as far as I know, a major a substantial classical text is Linda Spinazze's edition of Maximian's poems on, on the website Musicsque, Deoque. Um, uh, this is the best, um, most uh, informative, most reliable edition of this text, the poems of Maximian. And you, you can also see here how the richness of the apparatus, these words in blue, all have some kind of a note to them. It's a major, it's, it's, a, it's a very important product of research, and this was born digital, there is no paper version. Um, the second digital critical edition was actually, it was made by me, it's called Catalogus Online, and it's, it has a, it had a, a different genesis. Um, I, I drew up a repertory of conjectures on Catullus, so a very, very rich critical apparatus, and then I published this with a, a, along with the text of the poems. So you have a critical, a critical edition with the richest amount of notes that is just about imaginable. And this is, here on this slide, you see one way of visualizing this um, Website and um, it has other contents and other characteristics which I shall not discuss here. You can go and look for yourselves. Um, but one feature that I'm particularly proud of is that I have been able to include images of three of the four most important manuscript witnesses of the text, and these are connected to the individual lines. So, for instance, here you see the the manuscript the images of two of the three independent manuscript sources of poem one, line two, or Catullus. And this is, the image here is um, the first page of the Oxford manuscript of, of Catullus. Uh, one manuscript couldn't be sadly included for reasons of, of copyright and permissions. Um, projected bodies of digital critical ed editions include, um, well, they, um, there are two, 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 two of them. The Digital Latin Library is being prepared at the University of Oklahoma under the direction of Samuel Husky. And um, in a big research project funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, um, Sam and his colleagues are preparing, um, uh, among other things, and a digital infra infrastructure for critical editions of classical Latin texts and uh, and medieval ones and Renaissance ones at that. And they, among other things, they are constructing a long-term partnership with three learned associations that are um, uh, that aim to guard to, to to control the quality of the editions that they they prepare and they publish there. Um, and my boss, Javier Velata, at the University of Barcelona, is leading a group with whom we are preparing a, a network of, of, of uh, digital critical editions called Latin Literature Online. Um, we are making some progress with that as well, and, and it's a similar concept to the D Digital Latin Library. Um, we are less well-funded. On the other hand, we have a lot of philologists um, within arm's reach, because Spain and also Italy, continental Europe, has a, a, a fairly rich tradition of uh, Latin textual criticism, and we can draw on a big pool of, of, of scholars. Why should we care? Why should we, why do we need digital critical edition of classical Greek and Latin texts? Uh, why, why worry so much about this 
apparently small scholarly um, problem. Well, for one thing, it would be good to have reliable texts of classical Greek and Latin literature online. Um, academic research throughout the world, and especially in places far from good, uh, well-endowed research libraries. I'm Hungarian, so I know what this means in practice. Um, and I would also I would also aim to create better, newer critical editions than the ones that are available so far. Searchable editions, interconnected ones, and editions that contain images of manuscripts. And um, the, the most interesting possibility is that digital critical editions could enable new kinds of textual scholarship. So perhaps collaborative editing and editing by non professionals and also editions that are not fixed but that evolve that can be improved on over time with all the possibilities and all the challenges that this implies um the critical edition of classical greek and latin literature involves a lot of challenges some of which are obvious others are not so um for convenience i list the main issues here. Um, there is a lack of models and established structures, so we have to work out what to do on our own. And um, well, that's being changed. So yesterday, Angelo's presentation um, uh, set out some possibilities, but and, and I think that people are working on, on an inf infrastructure for digital critical editions. Now, it would be good to have some models. Um, there is a need to combine philological and IT skills, so two kinds of highly specialized skills that are not that common and then they have to overlap in some way. Editing of classical texts is laborious and slow. I see no way around that. And digital projects, as I have said, they have sadly limited prestige. And technological change threatens to wipe out class projects, so we have to find a way around that and my proposal is to create under some kind of name under some kind of guise in some kind of guise a digital publishing house why um so as not to have a research project but an enabler of future research projects um a shortcut that will if you like that will um solve some of the problems associated with digital scholarship um to help to provide a permanent and regularly updated digital infrastructure, namely editorial software and storage. Dedicated editorial staff who can assist with whatever practical problems might arise while you are editing. Um, and then outside experts doing a lion's share of the scholarly work as academic publishers are, uh, as, as is the case with academic publishers in print today rigorous quality control, I'm sorry, I will not give this up, and strong roots in the academic community, and possibly the prestige necessary to obtain funding and academic contributions and to survive in the long run. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions. Well, um, look, uh, the name publishing house is perhaps too conservative and it was meant to be a little provocative uh, because among other things, publishing houses are companies and they, they produce um, objects that they sell. And, um, and they, they, they maintain themselves and they, they exist on a commercial thanks to their commercial activities um but one of the things that they do is peer review and and i i would i think that that's important it's important to have some kind of feedback from the the academic community before and after publication and but i also think that uh it would be very good to 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 solve the 
logistical pr problems involved in digital publishing uh, or to, 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 to make it easier for scholars to publish digitally. And I, I, I don't know the resource you have just named, but, but um, if I understand correctly, they don't do the second task. editorialized as usual. Um, so thank you for this. Uh, I think that a problem with Sam Husky faces is mentioned to me, and I don't think it's any secret, is he has no editors. <laughs> uh, and it's all very well and good to have though the blessing of professional associations, but the problem is isn't just digital publication. The problem is that the working assumption at least on that side of the Atlantic, is that the 500 years of, of reconstructing the texts, the prospects of actually making substantive progress in that task are considered implausible. Uh, and in fact, the reason why I can tell you there's terribly little interest in newer editions when people actually use the text to understand them as opposed to editors. My experience, I've worked on this for 30 years. Well, that's the case in a country which I shall not name, where where uh, the there is, I think, only one chair in digital humanity, uh, no, in 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 critical tec Latin textual criticism, in, and they are thinking oh, of sure. of closing it, that, and it's a it's a big shame, and and connected to that is is a lack of knowledge about uh, the the basis on which our our knowledge. Uh, 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 our, our grasp of classical texts relies, and then you get uh, academic journals that sometimes make howlers um, about textual criticism. We don't accept howler as a, as a term. Thank you, that's not a Sorry. British thing, uh, which we don't, you know, we'll try not to do that anymore. So, Sorry. I think that the case that needs to be made, hasn't been made, was why this is compelling for people who are interested in the culture of Greece the Rome, why the, the, the improvement in text. And, and I just want to say that's a, that's a challenge. I know you could pull out a half dozen critical things that show why it's incredibly important. But in practice, and I've been in this conversation for a long time with editors, and I'm saying the case for editing, this is not a, I, you said it's important. And you, can, and you can pull out 10 cases where you say, look, here's a case where people made a mistake in interpretation. But you're not going to find 10,000. Maybe you will. But I think this is something I wish you could do it. But this is this is a challenge. But I will say that the thing which I, I can see immediate impact and change is in the interest of the manuscripts mm -hmm. and in the textual transmission. And that's where I see the Homer multitext as a sort of rebirth of people in looking at paleography. Uh, and thinking about them, what is the meaning of this edition? What is the meaning of this manuscript? What is the meaning of this early modern tradition? You know, in its intellectual context. And I think there, there's, you know, you can make an argument or not about whether you're going to make progress in a, in a better reconstructing the text of virtual. I, you don't have to make any argument at all. It's clear our understanding of tradition of the reception of virtual at every level is being completely rebuilt. And it engages a huge audience of people. Uh, are these students who become who work on things like the Veneta Day, which I would thought was impossible 15 years ago? So I think the easy the easy case is when you talk about non-professionals and you talk about the prominence of manuscripts and the prominence of this kind of close reading, looking at how this edition differs from that edition in this context or that context. I think that's going to be an easy sell, uh, and or or you'll be able to make a compelling case for that. So that, so I'm not telling you you shouldn't make this, you shouldn't do this. I'm just saying <laughs> this is the case that we're uh, saying it hasn't worked where I live, and I know it works here, but you're losing all your chairs. Well, in this Germany, I started with we lost 27 percent of our chairs in ancient cultures and languages. So whatever we're doing is not working. I, I, I wasn't involved in any of that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're not making our case. We're not making our case. 